Hello, welcome to the symposium practice research interdisciplinary methodologies in cultural and higher education institutions. I am Carolina Ritu, Professor of Creative Practice Research at the Center for Arts, Memory and Communities at Coventry University. I am co-hosting this event with my colleague, Professor Anthony Downey from Birmingham City University, and we would like to welcome you all to this event today. We organize this research event with practitioners and researchers in the field of practice research to explore and discuss the challenges and opportunities in developing new methodologies in research-led practices and in collaborations with the cultural sector. The event will foster a conversation between academics, art professionals, and PhD researchers to collectively consider how academic research can evolve from research about to research through practice and research with cultural organizations. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of the HRC Midlands for Cities doctoral training program who made this event possible, including the director, Nicola Royan, and also thank the research team at Coventry University, especially Kosar Hussain and Leonor Rodriguez Esteves for their continuous support and to Birmingham City University colleagues. The structure of the event today is the following. After Anthony's and my initial introduction, in which we will touch upon the main points to be discussed today, we will introduce our first keynote speaker, Michael Schwab, and hand over to Michael for a 30 minute presentation titled Expositionality, Disturbing Facts. This will be followed by a 30 minute Q&A there is plenty of time for discussion, so please hold on until the Q&A to share questions and comments with Michael. At 11.30, after the first keynote, there will be two workshops. The workshop number one, Curatorial Methods and Art Institutions, is convened by Gavin Wade, and the title is Artists and Engineers Link and Shift. Workshop two, Artistic Research, is convened by Professor Mel Jordan and is titled Rehearsing Practice Research. Please note that these workshops will run simultaneously, so you will decide which one you want to join. And the links for each workshop are here in the chat box. Make sure you join the right workshop and for more details about their framework, visit the event registration page in Agenda and you will find the workshop synopsis. The link to the event agenda should also appear here on the chat box. Also during the workshops, we will keep a slide in this room where we are now with the links in case you join later. After the workshop, we break for lunch and reconvene at 2 p.m. here in this main room. So use this room link to join the afternoon session. We will start with Emily Pringle's keynote titled Practitioner Researcher in the Art Museum in Turbulent Times, again followed by 30 minute Q&A. And again, for questions and comments, just wait until the Q&A to share with Emily. After Emily's talk, we will have the final panel of today's symposium with the presentation and discussion of the publication I co-edited with Bill Belasquez, Institution as Praxis, New Curatorial Directions for Collaborative Research. And this was published by Sternberg Press in 2020. The panelists include myself, Anthony Downey, Michael Burschel, Emily Pringle, Sean Vaughan, and Bill Belasquez. For any details about the running order, visit the event registration page, agenda tab again, and this is something that will be shared as well uh, on the chat box. Before we start, some housekeeping notes. Please be aware that this event is being recorded. Note that for questions and comments, they can be submitted via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, which you can use throughout the event. Alternatively, you can also ask questions or share comments by saying in the Q&A box that you want to ask a question and we will unmute your mic when prompted. The workshops are slightly different because they will be hosted as meetings. So you are invited to keep your video, and, uh, video on and during the sessions, please mute uh, your microphone unless invited to speak. And during the workshops, you can ask questions by raising your hand or writing in the chat box. I believe we are now quite familiar with this process. Now, just shortly about the topics of the event. 
We could say that practice research in academia is a contested field, not so much because it is new and we are still trying to figure out what to do with it, but because academics seem to disagree with what it means, what to do with it, and moreover, how to validate it as research. Practice research can be described as simply being the research that is conducted via the means of practice. However, not any kind of practice. When we say practice, we do not always mean the same thing. One could argue that practice has long been part of academic research, be the practice of writing, the practice in the lab, the experiments, the field work. However, the practice I'm interested in, in is not the practice of conducting research or any of the practical activities that go into its development. Rather, the practice of practice research that I want to explore here includes a serious understanding of aesthetic and epistemic operations beyond lexical declarations and observable events. However, the current conditions are rather challenging. The model for practice research seems to be more and more based on STEM disciplines with the current imperative of metric evaluation, which relies upon statistical equivalence. In other words, everything can be compared as long as it can be quantified into a statistic. In this way, practice has been invited to enter the protocols of research and then under a new positivist conception of research understood as a move from secrecy to transparency, from abstraction to efficiency. Also, practice has been invited to enter the protocols of research as an add-on or a case study included in the methods deployed by the so-called more rigorous disciplines from social sciences to engineering, etc. Here, the arts are seen as providers of a set of new creative variables to be observable and evaluated as case studies according to the disciplinary frameworks of the lead discipline. Although collaboration between disciplines is always welcome, the fact that these permissions have monopolized the validation of practice has paid a significant disservice to the field. This tendency has compromised the development of key aspects intrinsic to practice research. Because contrary to protocols of research validation, practice research is partial and errant, tentative and opaque, and moves through the radical incompleteness of the subject matter. It does not produce a final and conclusive output that can be clearly disseminated and cannot be formalized in pre-established templates. It is driven by the conditions of the materials at stake, infrastructural, epistemic, ecological, and the constraints and inevitabilities of the unplanned encounters. It invites the formation of communities of concerns and solidarity instead of validating the assumption of uh, audience segments. It is always in collaboration and it is radically interdependent of all the past, present and future dialogues with others and our multiple selves. It embraces the complexity of the conditions in which we live. So today, together with our guest speakers and the audience contributions, we would like to address the following questions. What do we mean by practice research and how does it contribute to the development of knowledge systems within and beyond academia? Individual arts are increasingly defined, if the visual arts are increasingly defined as a means to both question and produce knowledge, then what value do HEIs, higher education institutions, assign to the performative exploratory and speculative production of knowledge in the arts. How do collaborations between the higher education institutions and cultural partners have changed the way we research? What are the opportunities for practice research in the intersections between these two sectors? And finally, how can we create a more confident ecology to advocate for practice research and its specificities in academia? I hope we have the chance to explore these questions and more. Thank you again for joining us today. I will now hand over to Anthony for his introduction and also to introduce Michael Schwab. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Carolina, thank you for your introduction. And uh, it's great to see so many colleagues here this morning from Birmingham City University and Coventry University. I just wanted to use the next five minutes to raise a number of questions and refer back to your point relating to what forms of knowledge are being produced through practice-based research. 
And I want to start with uh, just a series of questions, general questions, I hope not too generic. And I hope that we will return to them as we proceed. I think, I think the core question that I wanted to ask was relatively straightforward. How does practice-based research disrupt epistemological utilitarianism? Or to put it more simply, how does practice question the use value and application of knowledge as a form of research? I would suggest that if we pose these questions or pose that question, we immediately enter into a further question. And that is largely to do with how we understand research in the context of academe. How can such questions expand upon the radical capacity of research within academic settings? Now, again, this would entail a further series of questions and they would be directed towards key specific points, one of which would be KTPs, knowledge training partnerships. And I think other elements would come into play around how we understand knowledge economies in relation to, for example, the research excellence framework, and indeed, perhaps more immediately, in relation to doctoral training partnerships. Now, again, we would be exploring questions around impact, uh, something of a key word that I'm sure all our colleagues and staff at BCU and Coventry University have been wrestling with for some time. But how does practice-based research play into how we idealize or indeed position the notion of impact, specifically around the politics of epistemology and the politics of knowledge production? I think the second question, and just to expand upon that a little bit more, is how we understand the context of practice-based research through the demands placed upon it by the corporate, privatized, and indeed academic sectors. I mean, how do we utilize and how do we understand those pressures? Now, again, this begs a further question, and I guess it is one of the bigger questions and perhaps a perennial question. Why do we look to practice-based research or art practices as a means to produce knowledge. I mean, where are those demands coming from? Where are those institutional, curatorial, critical, corporate, privatized, and indeed ac academic demands coming from? And what do they tell us about the event of knowledge production in our post-digital age? Now, again, I want to emphasize, this has not been a one-sided uh, process of co-option Corporate interests, privatized interests, academic interests have not merely co-opted art as a practice or art as a means to produce research. Art as a means to produce research has very readily imbricated itself within those demands, utilized those demands for better or worse to affect its own series of impacts and outputs. I would add to that something relatively straightforward and given these tensions, given these uh, processes, the practice of art today is not supplemental to debates around knowledge production. It's absolutely central and in many ways predicates many of the debates we're having. This sense that somehow practice-based research is an addendum to questions around knowledge epistemologies and the event of knowledge production needs to be examined more closely because I would argue, and perhaps we will come back to this as we proceed, that they are absolutely central to those debates. The final question I would ask is, what alternative epistemological systems are being progressed or speculatively positioned through practice-based research? I think from my own perspective, it's interesting to look at the way in which practice-based research, artistic practice, has affected a series of interventions that have questioned, historically questioned, the determinisms of colonial discourse, the rationalizations and racial determinisms of colonial discourse. And again, this content. Uh, sorry, I don't, I hope you can see me. Um, I think Anthony's internet, my, um, might have gone down. So maybe what we could do uh, is to move to, Anthony, you're back. Can you hear us? I'm not sure what happened there. Can you hear me again? Yes, we can. My apologies, that's actually never happened before. Okay, um, over to you. Carolina, just to continue this, and 
I mean, again, it's working towards my final question, actually. How does the field of practice-based research generate methodologies through interdisciplinary practices? And, and this is to argue that the research knowledge coming out of practice-based research inevitably engages in interdisciplinarity that we could consider to be a methodology in and of itself. And Carolina, I went back to the event that you staged, hosted in 2019 in Coventry, March 2019. I had thought that that event was about a decade ago, but it turns out it's only two years ago. And I was thinking back to the presentations we gave that day. You co-hosted myself, uh, Maria Halajova, and other speakers on the day. And I was thinking back to what I put forward in relation to practice then, practice as a form of speculative research. And I was thinking how that actually held up two years later. At that particular conference, I spoke about a, a research series that I was producing at that time called Practice Research, and that involved three artists at that time. It's since been expanded. And I think, again, just thinking about those artists in particular, and I just want to list them and just extrapolate very briefly on what I understand to be their methodologies in relation to their practice-based research. I was thinking about Michael Rakovitz and his restaging of a concert that Leonard Cohn never gave in Ramallah. Michael suggested and has proposed restaging that in Ramallah. However, subject to boycott, uh, that concert has never happened. The original Leonard Cohen concert never happened and Michael's concert never happened. And what I saw in that moment of Michael's practice and the amount of research he puts into that is the artwork becoming a barometer of sorts for the geopolitics of the Middle East. And in that moment, it becomes a form of historical intervention. I was also thinking of Larissa Sansur's practice and the book we uh, produced with Larissa called Heirloom, which tied in with the Venice Biennial show that Larissa had in 2019, curated by Nat Muller, one of our PhD students. Larissa positions her own practice-based research in relation to speculative sci-fi fiction, thus displacing a lot of the questions, the political questions of the present into the future, opening up a new expanded speculative space to explore those issues. Now, again, I see her practice-based research as a form of speculative engagement, which is very productive in an academic setting and questions what we understand to be speculative historical research. Last week, I closed a show in London with Heba Amin, and I also worked on a show with, uh, sorry, I also worked on a book with Heba. And for those of you who know Heba's work, uh, Heba is very engaged with digital methodologies, specifically in the context of the Middle East asking very clear questions about how we think from within the digital as opposed to merely reflect upon it. Now, again, I'm quite interested in the way in which that practice-based research, those forms of practice question and reconfigure our engagement with the methodologies of the digital. Again, I would expand upon that and focus a little bit more on the way in which knowledge production in the arts has now entered into, dare I say, the demands of producing evidence or an evidentiary context. I think, for example, at the seminal work of, now seminal work of forensic architecture, but also artists such as Heba Amin, Shona Illingworth, Trevor Paglin, Harun Faraki, and others. And the way in which art is increasingly being brought forward or challenged forward into this arena of knowledge production in order to provide the parameters within which we understand or re-articulate modalities of evidence. Now, again, I think this is particularly timely for a number of reasons. Practice-based research increasingly is engaged with questioning, dare I say, the accelerationism associated with digital methodologies and indeed the accelerationism associated with information and communication technologies more generally. Now, again, what I see happening there is potentially a new field of research being opened up whereby we question these assumptions from within these practice-based research methodologies, as opposed to applying our own academic setting to them. So these are the three points I wanted to raise. Uh, they are all associated with how practice-based research disrupts epistemological utilitarianism, how it questions the use value and applications of knowledge as a form of research, and how we understand that in relation to the demands of corporations, private institutions, higher education institutions, cultural institutions, and indeed the critical setting of this particular event today. 
So Carolina, I will leave it at that. And I will now introduce our first speaker of the day, Michael Schwab. Michael's talk is Expositionality, Disturbing Facts. And I will just read a very, very brief uh, overview of Michael here. Michael is the founding editor of the JAR, the Journal for Artistic Research. During the first years of SAR, he was responsible for the ORSI and its development, coining the notion of exposition along the way. Most of his writings and some of his art and research is accessible through his ORSI profile, which is available online. Uh, regarding expositionality, you might also want to check out a recent chapter, which we are just putting a link up to now. So I'm going to pass over to Michael, more or less on time. And Michael, welcome this morning. And the floor is yours, sir. Great. Thanks so much for the invitation. And um, great that so, so many people turned up to this, uh, to this event. Um, I've got half an hour. So I'm going to try to focus on a single point in this half hour, um, which is difficult, I find, uh, to respond to. So I won't have a lot of answers, but um, I hope I can create the, the setting for you maybe to continue discussing uh, some of that. Um, it'll be um, a presentation that I've uploaded to the research catalog that was just mentioned. And um, I'm basically going to share uh, my screen for the time of the presentation keeping in mind that uh, the presentation itself is somewhat experimental. I'm still trying to work out myself how to actually operate in these um, remote uh, situations in a live presentation setting. So I'll be curious also to hear uh, how, how that went. Anyway, I'm going to share my screen now. And I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see. Great, thank you. So, so this is um, the title, Expositionality. So it's a complex word. I hope I can explain it a little bit better. Um, and I'm going to focus on how facts um, from the Latin factum are actually able to disturb some of this epistemic fabric that we are we are in, and there's a question of agency coming in at this point, and of course, political dimensions. I won't be going into that in any great detail, um, but uh, again, it's a jumping off point for this. Um, the backdrop of this, of course, is the Journal for Artistic Research, which I consider to be a research project in its own right. And uh, a lot of the, the thinking I've invested in this area has come through loads of conversations with the editorial board, with peer reviewers, with artists uh, along the way. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a very hands-on process. Um, and again, I haven't really finished making sense of this all. Um, important though, for me, is, is the fact that um, the Journal for Artistic Research is independent. It's independent in various ways. It's independent insofar as there's not a single university nor a, um, a specific funding framework that would be able to tell us what we should be doing. In fact, when the Journal for Artistic Research was founded uh, together with the Society for Artistic Research in 2010, um, I asked specifically the question of, uh, to the members of the then founded Society for Artistic Research what they expected and people said, you know, please don't repeat what we are doing locally. You know, we want to have something else happening within the field. So I took this very much as, as our task to test what is possible in a very specific and quite tight um, framework of a peer-reviewed academic journal, um, which is the format we appropriated. I have to mention that this first meeting was in Bern. And as you can see from this slide, um, uh, there's already uh, some gestures happening at this place. And Florian Dombois, who co-founded um, the society and the journal uh, with me and others, um, commissioned uh, Manuel Burgener for some installations that were uh, around the space. And one you can see here, which is a, a sculptural piece that uh, partly stood in front of the, the projection space. And Florian always insisted and was interested in, in the way that 
media on all levels actually uh, um, impact, change, um, engage with materials differently and with people and, and experiences differently. So there's not a sense of, of a transparent representation of what the journal is. There's no sense of, you know, me now transparently communicating to you <laughs> what it is that we are doing. Um, and that's kind of symbolized through, through this, this idea that the projection isn't really transparent either. There will be moments you can't read what's on the screen and so on. And we try to keep this really as, uh, as, a, main, as a main element that um, we don't want to suggest communication in the form of, I pass on information from A to B, but as a, as a much more active and complicated process. So instituting, is really at the heart of what we've been doing, but I think it's also at the heart of any, um, in a way, research project, research activity, because after all, you know, research is also, uh, um, research also institutes knowledge. So I think very much of, of existing knowledge as, you know, an institutional form of research. In order to support this, this question of instituting a little bit more, I've got a quote here, by a colleague of mine, Ezekiel Kopelto, who is now in, in Malmö. Um, and I'm just going to read this, this out shortly. I might make it a little bit bigger so I can read it even. So insofar as every institution is established and sustained by human beings, each one of them has once been a genuine human invention. Research makes up inventions, which insofar as they're of public interest, are also at least potentially new institutions and thus carry out critical changes in the institutional status quo. The inventiveness of an invention is therefore linked to the institution as their future. Artistic research not only takes place in institutions, but it should also conduct research on them, take institutions as its object, from the aesthetic institutions of perception and effect to current political institutions through showing how the latter are connected to the former or even based on them. Instituting always implies reinstitution, the changing of fundamental forms. And of course, uh, and just as a side note, this is linked to uh, potentially uh, Michel Foucault's uh, notion of episteme, perhaps with the difference that uh, I would focus much more on the multiplicity and the, the kind of uh, patchwork nature that the knowledge fabric within which we are inventing actually entails. Um, now, crucially, I would say um, there is no knowledge that enters the world, there is no institution without actually uh, articulations. So whenever we, we talk about what art is or what knowledge is or what practice is, you know, we are actually basing this on articulations of art, practice, knowledge, research, whatever it is. And my work is mainly focused on problematizing what we understand uh, by articulation. What is happening when I make a case for this to be research, when I make a case for this to be art. And um, articulation in this sense is really understood in the broadest possible um, framework. That is not only propositional language, um, terms and concepts you might be using, but any um, uh, you know, constellation that we can make sense of. Um, for me personally, and again, everybody has their own uh, little history in the field. Um, for me personally, um, Katie McLeod and Lynn Holdrich's book, uh, Thinking Through Art, Reflections on Artist Research at the time, um, was quite, quite crucial because um, I somehow felt um, it was the first moment I witnessed where this this idea of practice-based or practice-led research was really challenged as a um, paradigm, you might say, um, through this idea that, that art was articulated as research. It wasn't practice-based uh, research, it was actually a form of, um, of articulation. And more in the introduction than actually in the chapters of the book, um, they are they're reflecting on this, on this specific um, uh, situation. Um, and again, interestingly, <laughs> it is not um, a key reference they're using from a developing discourse of artistic research, but is actually um, a key reference that comes out of 
you know, critical thinking uh, curating. Um, in particular, Stephen Melville's uh, essay from a exhibition catalog, uh, Counting as Painting, um, is quoted. And I think for this whole idea of articulation to work, we need to really um, think about materiality at the moment of articulation. So I just want to quickly, again, um, pick up this key quote from his catalog to, to give you a bit of a, of a sense of the direction here. So there's some general statements that appear to belong to the field as a whole, including our field, I would say. So first, matter thinks. So thinks here evidently means makes a difference. So the proposition is that matter gives itself over to difference or to a process of difference. And this process must be grounded in matter opening itself to sense through some interruption of its apparent absolute continuity with itself. The ground of thought is something like a cut or a fold, a moment of delay or excess in which substance refigures itself as relation. And thirdly, because thought taken this way is above all articulation, matter is not conceivable apart from language and the structures of difference to which it gives particularly compelling expression. There is no perception and so no visibility that is not also a work of articulation. So if we're entering a field in which art matters epistemically, um, and if we're accepting that uh, there is no art without at least some degree of materiality, uh, we have to take seriously that a lot is happening on a level where language might be implied, but it's not exercised in the way that I can recognize this as language, a proto-language, if you want, or, or a liminal language. And it's crucial for us to pay attention to those moments um, outside of um, propositional knowledge. However, articulation is somehow a weak concept, I would say, because it's not the biggest challenge. I mean, anything can be articulation and I can kind of, um, uh, you know, just interpret a lot of works of art along the way. What I'm really interested in, and of course that's the site of, in a way, the research disciplines, is publishing. Because this is the moment where difference has to be made. Um, uh, this is the moment where basically something is accepted as a contribution in the widest sense or not. So our, in a way, field um, within which we try to establish um, uh, other approaches to, to knowledge is, uh, is first of all defined through publishing activities. Now, if articulation matters in the way I've illustrated, it also matters at the side of publishing. And the key example I'm just gonna to use to, to illustrate this is of course uh, the way um, Fountain uh, came into the world, not as a piece on a, on a plinth. In fact, that was rejected. It came into the world, first of all, as a publication um, and a story of rejection, but nevertheless, uh, this is how the piece was made uh, in a magazine called The Black Man and with various media elements photograph by Stieglitz uh, and other elements. Um, so in retrospect, we are recreating a modernist piece of work, but it is the publication that actually made that possible. Without the publication, there wouldn't be this piece. It's very much dependent on this. Now, in this sense, publication isn't really um, what comes after the creative act. So it's not like you're in the studio and you're doing your work and then you think, right, I'm done with that. Let me publish, you know, a, an article about this. So you're moving materials from the creative act through say reflection or documentation into a discursive act. It's much more complicated than that. In fact, I would argue it looks a little bit like this. Uh, publication is a distributed event with temporal effects. So first of all, there is no end point that is clearly identifiable or a beginning point for that matter for the creative act. We are uh, in a way in a, in a kind of a zone with very blurred fringes. And within that, there are many moments at, at which we go public in different ways. So it may be um, a speech, it may be a website, it may be a chapter, it may be an exhibition, it may be a performance. And they all actually, um, as they, as they are negotiating, as they're articulating what it is that I'm articulating in a public space, um, have two effects. Um, uh, one is they um, have the power, you might say, in the articulation itself 
to change what we, what we believe to have been the case. So for instance, to make us reinterpret what we thought we knew already. Um, the, uh, to the degree that that's, uh, uh, what we think are historical facts may be changed quite dramatically at this moment, or what we believe to, uh, to have been our, our understanding or knowledge until that time. And likewise, there's a future dimension to that, that uh, what's gonna be possible, the potentialities associated with different elements that are being brought into uh, that sphere also changes. New worlds become possible differently. Um, but this is not like a single event, although it's stylized like a single event here, <laughs> mostly in research it isn't. Um, uh, it is actually quite a complex uh, fabric of articulations distributed in various ways. To give you a quick example, uh, I have to really rush through things, is uh, this recent um, uh, project, uh, the German project, um, that created a catalog, double vision, the catalog um, of an exhibition that brought together works by Dürer and Kentridge. Um, and uh, I've got a small slideshow here to show you uh, how that looked a little bit inside the catalog. The catalog too is an articulation of a specific type. So you get this kind of um, uh, way of laying out the table of contents. Um, and you get these chapters, um, uh, pictures migrating and mutating. So labels that set you up in particular ways. And then you get, first of all, a, an overview of the materials that are being presented in this chapter as small thumbnail images, you might say. And then you're entering the plates section, like large reproductions of pieces. Um, that create a certain narrative. So you're moving from, in this case, to Dura um, uh, images, then to Kentridge, and then differently organized some of Kentridge's work. Um, included in the catalog is a chapter on the exhibition to which that catalog was published as it was conceived and why the space was created in this particular way. So you have, uh, in a way, um, the rationale for the organization within the exhibition space that you may have just seen or that you're gonna see uh, in a moment. Um, however, so we have exhibition and a catalog. However, there's also um, a second book that they've published uh, in German only, uh, Evidenzen des Expositorischen, which is an academic book about the project in the way it's actually dealing with what may be considered to be evident. Uh, evidence in this moment. Now, interesting, uh, many things interesting, but what I think is, is crucial for my point is that um, by that time, they had two exhibitions and um, the curators and the different people involved in the different exhibitions had also a chapter in which they were um, showing how that exhibition looked, what they changed, what the effects were on the work. Um, and uh, you get a sense that uh, this is actually a pretty open-ended process. Um, there's not a single definitive, de definitive exhibition. In fact, you know, there's not a single definitive catalog nor book that could be published out of this. So here's the second one. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that, that we may, in hindsight, look at particular events as being paradigmatic but in reality, um, there's a lot happening below the surface of, of that kind of historization of, of art, for example, in this case. Big debate who actually the author of, of the fountain is. Big debate um, uh, how the, um, uh, the structures of making the piece actually happened, at what part this catalog, uh, this magazine played, and so on. Um, so, considering this really as, as a complicated moment. And of course, Char is just a part, the journal is just a part in what you as authors might be choosing to create. Now, um, another element that's necessary for my, for my single argument um, is uh, what has been called virtual witnessing. So none of this would work if there wasn't a situation possible where I could actually um, understand something without having seen the, the, the stuff itself that was presented. So for example, I, I didn't see this piece in the flesh, in the material. Am I able to say something about this exhibition? I haven't witnessed this exhibition. I didn't go to the spaces. 
am I able to actually say something about this, not having, having seen this in the flesh and so on. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some form of virtuality attached to publishing because publishing is always that distance removed moment in that process. And likewise, you know, a thesis or, or some other presentation will most likely not give you everything materially at hand. It will be negotiated in what has been called a virtual you know, uh, setting while still enabling whoever experiences this setting to make up their mind as to the status of what it is that was presented. And this, um, according to some of the literature has um, started as a problem early on within the sciences, which on the onset didn't really accept uh, empirical and experimental science in particular. There's a big fight happening around um, what is the epistemology of actually experimental science within quite a different um, cultural setting at the time. And Robert Boyle is quoted um, as uh, not only the father and the inventor of the air pump, but also the inventor of experimental science and what goes with that. Now I'm relating to, to science here, not because art and research has to become like science. I'm relating to it more in terms of the kinds of cultural problems and the history of cultural problems and the history of publishing in that sense and um, making knowledge um, we have, and we should be able to have a relationship to that. So there's, there's one moment I, I'd like to pick out and um, uh, ideal also problematized in different ways. But just to say what I'm picking out of, Chapin's interpretation of Boyle's work is summarized in this quote. Um, the foundational category of the experimental philosophy and of what counted as properly grounded knowledge generally was an artifact of communication and of whatever social forms were deemed necessary to sustain and enhance communication. I argue, so Chapin, that the establishment of matters of fact utilized three technologies, a material technology embedded in the construction and operation of the air pump, a literary technology by means of which the phenomena produced by the pump were made known to those who were not direct witnesses and a social technology which laid down the conventions natural philosophers should employ in dealing with each other and considering knowledge claims. The technology of virtual witnessing involves the production in a reader's mind of such an image of an experimental scene as obviates the necessity for either its direct witness or its replication. Likewise, for an exhibition catalog, I, um, if it works, I, 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 it, it would not be necessary for me to have been in the exhibition to actually understand um, the contribution or an element of the contribution that this exhibition might have created. But once we enter this space of virtual witnessing, the multiplication of witnesses could be in principle unlimited. It was therefore the most powerful technology for constituting matters of fact, as Boyle called them, the validation of experiments and the crediting of the outcomes as matters of fact necessarily entailed their realization in the laboratory of the mind and the mind's eye. What was required was a technology of trust and assurance that the things had been done and done in the way claimed. Of course, there's a lot of science stuff around this, um, which we can discuss, but crucial is here that the audience, uh, the readers are empowered to realize the experiments themselves in their mind. And when they do this and arrive at similar outcomes, um, uh, whatever uh, Boyle has claimed about, uh, you know, physical properties, you know, would be um, would be accepted and acceptable. Um, we have a similar argument, I think, um, in uh, Norman Bryson's uh, book *Vision and Painting* to move into the sphere of art, um, where um, what we consider realism isn't really a realistic copy of the world, but it's also uh, conceived as an artifact of communication. It is something that um, it's an articulation that convinces us through the way it's operating that what's on that picture, the realist picture is actually real. Now, um, crucially for, um, uh, for Bryson, um, the realist image achieves parts of its persuasiveness by including within itself information 
not directly pertinent to the task of producing meaning. In other words, I would say that if Boyle, if, if these painters, or if you as researchers were simply putting forward information, interpretation of the work you've done, you would not empower a, a reader to make sense themselves and therefore make up their own minds as to what is happening. Um, there has to be a degree of noise, you might call it, I call it epistemic noise here in this context, um, to um, in a way create a setting within which reality can be negotiated and where meaning is not in a way given by authority of the artist or the scientist or whoever did that. Um, and I think that's quite a crucial element here that, that articulation must be not just opaque or intransparent, but also noisy. And in that sense, um, uh, productive at the moment of communication and not in a, in a, in a moment before and publication, not in a moment before. Now, Latour is quite clear in his own argument uh, around matters of fact that there's a bit of a, of a problem here that if we keep talking about matters of fact, we are not really looking um, sufficiently enough in how complex they are because we just take matters then factually. So this piece does this, you know, this is the fact of say, um, uh, you know, a vacuum, you know, within, within physics and so on. Now, um, Latour is quite aware of, of the need to also say that those matters of facts are part of moments of articulation. So the articulation of science, of experimental science, creates matters of facts as one necessary element, but it's not the way it works. It's, it's not because they are factual that um, we believe them to be the case. It's rather that the, the whole complexity of virtual witnessing creates this one element within its economy, you might say, something we believe to exist independently of us. Yeah. Um, so this um, uh, artifact of communication, which I uh, was um, describing in various bits of writing around exposition, um, in my mind, um, has the character of a multistable image. It's, it's something that is actually not settled. It's something that needs to be fundamentally open and it's open to propositions. So in this case, uh, this, this image is open to being identified as a hare or a duck. We know that, that example well, but it's also open to uh, perceptions that are not propositional. For instance, I've got some unidentifiable, unidentifiable black figure on a white background, say. Um, I've got some strange disfigured figures and so on. I see, I see strange elements in that. And so I see loads of things beyond you know, propositional uh, knowledges that are in there. And I'm targeting this moment of, of instability and multistability as a condition at which actually um, viewers and readers are empowered to, to understand with the effects I, I illustrated with the Duchamp. And that in a way uh, looks like this then. Um, uh, rather than um, publishing something that you made and then it's just being you know, added into a journal article, um, uh, that's one way to read that process. And yes, we do collect stuff and yes, we do publish it afterwards. At the same time, publishing is also realizing um, what it is that's being published. In a way, it's this infinite regress where we never know whether something was there already before it's been articulated or whether it's been made in the articulation. And that's a situation that cannot be defined. And in some sense, it's, um, it's a contradiction within the multistable image that the exposition is, but this contradiction can be authored. So when you're, when you're working expositionally, when you're articulating your artistic research uh, or your practice of statistic research, um, you are authoring a suspension of what is first, at what point uh, are actually um, uh, epistemic effects happening? Um, how can I rethink practice from this moment of, of articulation? How do I think uh, world might change from this moment of articulation? And so on. And 
And this suspension, this, this um, um, possibility of um, um, removing the ground for any, uh, in a way, clear propositional position at the most extreme means that any anchor, what is art, what is practice, what is research, will be almost self-defined at the moment at which it's articulated. Practice like this has never been. It has been only at this moment. Research has never been. It's been at this moment in this particular way and in no other way, okay? Um, and that's the moment of invention, um, as uh, suggested in Eza Kekopeldot's quote at the beginning. This is when, when knowledge is instituted. It's always instituted as something never heard of. It's something that in the most radical way must break with whatever um, it is supposed to fulfill institutionally and in terms of knowledge. Um, so that gets me to this point, and I'm not sure if I'm overrunning a little bit, I may have to rush. Um, there's two, two crucial um, uh, things I, I'd like to, uh, to draw from this. Um, and it's somehow maybe important for the discussion to be had about you know, academia and, and cultural institutes. One has to do with that, that science actually has um, in a way owned the notion of research. It's molded it and shaped it in ways that science seemed uh, felt fit for itself. So if you're looking at science and technology studies, um, historical epistemology and so on, you'll see how much of an illusion uh, uh, happens when it comes to uh, science reporting on itself. There's a lot of um, articulation happening in the self uh, description of science and in a way a misrepresentation of what research actually is now it works. So um, one aspect of my work anyway has been to question um, uh, the relationship between science and research and to think about um, whether there are different uses of the term, keeping in mind um, uh, this, um, uh, this situation that research is uh, uh, probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary, that's a quote by Linda Duhivai-Smith, um, when mentioned in many indigenous contexts, it stirs up silence, in cultures are bad memories, it raises a smile that is knowing and distrustful, the way in which scientific research is implicated in the worst excesses of colonialism remains a powerful remembered history for many of the world's colonized peoples. Um, this is clear and must be accepted. I mean, there, there's, no, um, there's no way around the fact that uh, science has not developed research to the full. And it's also problematic as you see the shift here in this quote from the word research to later on scientific research. Um, um, I, I, I would like to break this um, ideology that science owns research. The question is, how do we reinstitute research? How would we actually um, create a notion of research that is independent of the historical paradigm of science, in particular of progress, and the way you would give value to a knowledge contribution through its um, you know, uh, kind of, uh, historical difference that it can create. It has to create difference in a short amount of time, otherwise it's, it's not accepted. Um, and of course, there's a link to um, ideas of becoming research um, that uh, Eric Rogoff mentioned, and I'm aware there's a discussion happening with her too. Um, however, this means that this famous practice turn, you know, isn't really the right descriptor. And uh, I've heard uh, both speakers earlier mention practice led or practice based or practice quite a lot. I would argue that actually this is very much part of, of the um, institutional paradigm that, um, uh, that makes us think of art as a practice. Um, I think it's a misunderstanding of narrowing what art can be to a practice and it's a misunderstanding of, um, of believing that practice in art is its most essential contribution. Yeah. Um, so there has to be, um, through articulations, a redefinition, um, you might say, a reinstitution of what practice might mean 
in this context, or what art might be in this context. And the second element that, that, uh, that we're adding here, which has to do with what has been called the speculative term, is, is the fact that um, science is in various crises, and one of the crises is the delay in which it actually happens. So for instance, in, in AI, in artificial intelligence, we've got these um, highly uh, selling images now around. Uh, the point here is that um, we know how to do them, um, through, through those kinds of AI algorithms, but we don't know what they mean. We don't have a science of meaning for those works. We've got, we've got a science of producing. So they are realized in ignorance, yeah? And, um, and science, in a way, is not there yet, and still they operate on a market, and still they shape co contemporary culture. And the same is true within the corona crisis, where we have... Um, uh, science not really able to tell us how safe a vaccine is. And still the reality is we are being vaccinated. Um, we have to deal, deal with that. Um, so there's a moment of, of action, of actualization happening that is today happening before we arrive actually at proper knowledge. And the second point I want to rush through quickly and then I'm done is, um, my insistence on the notion of artistic within the journal's title and not of art, because this is in a way one of the key problems that, that come from the kind of um, uh, collaboration between art institutes and, and academic institutions, which has to do with that um, uh, the notion of contemporary art is within visual arts anyway, very much entrenched and I would say normative in many ways. Um, the, um, uh, um, if we were to use what contemporary art institutions claim to be arts as a standard within artistic research, we'd be excluding a lot of stuff. Chai is surprisingly non-contemporary in that sense, <laughs> um, uh, contemporary art in that sense. And I'm, I'm really, it's, it's one of the most, I don't know, uh, surprising realizations I had over those years. Um, what artists are, uh, are able to do and are interested in doing does not dovetail into what is represented within art institutions. So reinstitution also has to do with this and has to do with the institutionalization of the notion of art that comes as um, within a hierarchical form, put it like this. Artistic research in a way, um, by, by looking at minor um, um, practices, by looking at um, the kind of material dedication of, of people working artistically that nevertheless are not necessarily able to, um, uh, to connect with high definitions of, of, of art. And, and that's a key problem because we might be in a situation where academia tells us, um, you know, we have to write in particular ways and contemporary art institutes tell us we have to make art in contemporary ways. So we've got a very impoverished middle ground um, whilst the opposite is true. Um, so also art has to be reinstituted um, and um, there has to be a challenge towards the the contemporary paradigm or the paradigm of contemporaneity um, that takes place, that is still, in my own understanding, a, a residue of modernism. Um, and we see this within the power structure and the global paradigms within which contemporary art operates. So here's my final point. Um, uh, expositionality creates um, very small articulations. That's not big claims like, you know, what the world is, it's actually in this specific limited arrangement of stuff. That's how art may be identified. That's what research might be. That's how I'm thinking here. This is the resistance of the materials. These are the possibilities. Um, that's how you're affected by it and so on. Very limited, individual, singular articulations that are not yet connected up within a transcendental sphere of what epistemology of artistic research might be, and hopefully they will never be connected in this way. Which raises the, the key point, um, how do I connect the specific with the specific? So how am I actually instituting the, and, and, and keeping the value of singular articulations that are distributed in such a way that I don't have to go through some, uh, you know, criticism or interpretation or some other philosophical construct in order to actually create those linkages and pierce, you might say, the fabric of knowledge or 
in a way creates uh, or turn into a patchwork uh, uh, patchworks that would uh, show um, the, the kind of protocols and interfaces as I move from one um, epistemic um, horizon of this articulation to another epistemic horizon of this articulation. How does my understanding of knowledge change from this project to this project? How does my understanding of art change from this project to this project? And the second point is, this ha all happens because of the dedication in a way um, of, of artists, but also scientists, uh, one has to say, to um, getting deeper down into the phenomena, to actually wanting rather to enter the complexity of what they're doing, rather than um, uh, shortcut it through some explanations of that. Um, okay, so sorry, a little bit over one. That's uh, fine, Michael. Good. Thank you. So I'm, I'm stopping my share now, um, and you can, you can see me. Good, here we are. Michael, I want to give you a moment to catch your breath um, and thank you for that uh, thought-provoking presentation. Quite a number of ideas there. Uh, in the spirit of collaboration and engagement, I want to open the floor to the audience in the first instance, but I have a few uh, general comments which I want to come back to with you. But please take time to get your breath. And for the attendees, uh, if there are any direct questions, I understand we have the chat bar open that can be utilized. Equally, uh, if I understand correctly, Kaza, those questions can be asked directly over the current system, or maybe I'm mistaken in that respect. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Kaza. So please, folks, don't be shy. Um, Michael's raised, I think, on my estimation, at least six pertinent points relating to epistemological systems. Uh, I'm thinking again about how this relates to doctoral students, how that sort of reflects upon your own research or experience of research. So please feel free to ask questions. Uh, Michael, while people are gathering their thoughts, I thought I might just jump in with a few general points. Um, and I think your point about how we understand the very term practice is particularly germane. What does practice constitute? What is the event of practice? Before we even get to the ideal, and I use the term advisedly, the ideal of practice-based research, because effectively, again, I think that's what's under question here today. But this notion of practice itself is obviously eminent in these discussions. And it seems to me that what you are suggesting here to a certain extent is that we're shifting from research about practice, I use the term in inverted commas, to research with practice. How the epistemological frameworks that practice puts in place engage us in an expanded notion of the use value or indeed non-use value of knowledge itself. And I want to pick up on a term that you used, the episteme. And if I understood you correctly, you're drawing upon the Foucauldian notion of the episteme. Of Foucault's notion of the episteme, it's very associated with the apparatus, for want of a better term. But the apparatus as a productive function of a political, sociological, and indeed historical order. The apparatus was never negative for Foucault. Uh, it was never a reductive process. It enabled, to all intents and purposes, productive bodies, productive subjects to come into being. Of course, the means of that production were very much associated with a liberal and subsequently neoliberal order. But I want to ask you a question. Your understanding of episteme as an apparatus is obviously associated with the way in which that apparatus is producing knowledge about the artwork. It's producing knowledge about the artwork as a material effect, but it's also producing virtual knowledge about the artwork. And I'm wondering how this relates back to your understanding of propositionality or expositionality to use your term. And I was hoping you could address that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... Uh, it's all correct what you're what you uh, observing. Uh, the, the only point I'm trying to make is um, not so much, uh, you know, how right or wrong Foucault might be in his historical interpretation, mm. to try to suggest that, um, yes, there are um, uh, what I kind of called uh, 
epistemic uh, fabrics <laughs> within which we operate, so you might call this apparatus, but the point to me is, you know, they're actually much more patchworky. If you're looking at any single articulation, even the ones Foucault is relating to in the order of things, you know, um, they are articulating articulate such in such way that they enter this uh, universalized, universalized image of episteme. And my point is that within artistic research, what I see happening is that the, the articulations actually don't dovetail into each other, mm. often mm. not at all, um, always not seamlessly. So the question is, what episteme is it? What is the epistemological framework within which all of this happens? Um, and my answer is that, first of all, um, you know, it's based on, uh, in a way, articulations by which I reconstruct in each individual case, how the stuff hangs together. <laughs> Lazy by reference, more interestingly by appropriation, and uh, um, uh, even more interesting maybe by association, whatever it might be. There's quite complex um, uh, relationships that are being forged every time differently. And in a way, secondly, and that, that was kind of my argument with, with Latour and, uh, and Boyle matters of fact, is that um, this, uh, this site of articulation is very complex and people are interested in the complexity of this site. It spins off those understandings, but those understandings are never to be taken only as preconditions. They are also preconditions. As I said, this switching arrow <laughs> there, um, we can read them as preconditions for the articulation, but we can also say that the articulation makes them to preconditions of what's possible within the articulation and we cannot decide. Um, there's no ontology um, uh, in my model possible <laughs> that would decide for you um, whether it's A or B. Uh, it's necessary that it's suspended what it is. Otherwise, you could never break into <laughs> the existing um, you know, plane of, of, uh, um, of what's accepted as knowledge at any given moment. Hmm. You know, you reminded me of something here, and I think you're coming close to using the term quantum. Uh, the way in which it seems to all intents and purposes, practice-based research refuses quantum realities, opens up indeed non-quantum realities. And I was thinking a bit further about that, um, more in the sense of what precisely is happening with practice. And we have a question here from my colleague, Catherine Baker, and I'll just read the question, Michael, uh, because I think it ties in directly with questions of quantum reality, or dare I say, calculable, measurable realities the way in which practice-based research usurps or pushes against such realities and how that opens up the field of doubt. Uh, and I use the term advisedly, but I'll read the question from Catherine here because I think it plays into much of what we're talking about, epistemological variances or indeed modalities or indeed the oscillations of knowledge that we encounter in practice-based research. And here's the question from Catherine. When Michael was talking, I was reminded of Cartesian doubt and the process of not accepting believed knowns. And I wondered if this was something that Michael was aligned with. Um, really, uh, uh, I would argue in the sense of how Latour would uh, do that. So he would, he would in a way, uh, um, first of all, uh, highlight the social construct within which uh, that has historically happened, but at the same time also say that, that uh, we need to um, not move over completely into um, a, um, uh, a situation where we are actually not able to um, uh, have uh, create gr grounding, where we basically negotiate everything. And that is the crisis politically at the moment <laughs> that, that we don't have any, any proper tools in a way to, uh, to ground us the moment we don't have these, uh, you know, uh, Meta, metaphysical, ontological, political frameworks anymore. So, um, so it's it's linked to this historically, but the, but the moment today is different. The moment today is such that we have myriads of examples of of good living, and we are unable to make a political case on things. This is the problem that we have no connection. I mean, no model for a connection that is not already going through a trans transcendental um, you know layer. And and my 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 question is. How are we locally connecting? How are you guys, you know, in Coventry or wherever you are, connecting? 
And if I look at jar, say, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work. I mean, how people deal with each other's work, what authorship means in that context, collaboration status. And I mean, there's loads of issues around it. I can, I can discuss these too. But this is at stake. At stake is, do we need transcendental uh, levels to create solidarity? <laughs> or can we do that differently at the end of the day? Um, and it will go through articulations. There will be articulations that perform this, and there will be articulations that fail to do that. So in one articulation, I might be the great artist who is never, nobody can touch. <laughs> and the other articulation, I may create resonances and relationship with works of, of, of other people and social realities that people never thought about. <laughs> um, it's down to, to how is that actually brought into play in, in a ethical, epistemic and aesthetic context. Uh, maybe one more. Oh, Excuse me. Please continue, please. I just wanted to say with the quantum stuff, um, uh, this kind of Bohr Penrose thing, you know, like is subjectivity, you know, what makes the difference or not? And I would simply say it's again suspended. Um, mm -hmm. There's an always uh, like practice. I would also say that that what's the subject here that uh, in a way uh, measures when it enters the, the the quantum state is also, you know completely unclear. It's again, I think, a reconstruction that there needs to be this agency, but whether this agency is the observer or whether there's another agency that is you know, entangled in that process is also at stake. So, so to my mind, all these undecidables, um, somehow people have different opinions how, they, how to settle this error <laughs> between subject and object. But I would simply say, when you're presenting the problem, you don't have to settle this. Um, it's actually um, much more productive and maybe um, in a way uh, uh, does justice to the complexity of reality if we mm. accept that there is not a single answer to that setting. So the subject is neither external nor internal to the quantum process, for example, or whatever it might be. Sorry, I'm talking too much. No, no, I think what you've articulated there, Michael, is something which I hope is music to our doctoral students' ears. What we're faced with here are qualitative research-based practices that produce epistemological systems that are non-quantifiable within the context often of academic research. They therefore need to be rethought from within academe, higher education institutions, but equally they need to be rethought from within cultural sectors. So again, these indecisions, these oscillations of knowledge need to be understood as productive and again, I just want to use that sort of metaphor of the, 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 the quantum theory, even thinking about Schrodinger, you know, quantum realities, the polarization of reality itself is a means to engage with the richness of epistemologies, as opposed to reduce them to a measurable or indeed calculable metric. On that note, uh, I'm going to pass over to Carolina, who has raised her hand, and I think Carolina has some comments and some questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael, for your fantastic presentation. Um, I think I was very much taken by the question you posed at the end around uh, how to institute research that is independent from the colonial difference and also progress and, and how to be thinking of not only what that research is, but also what are the institutions that need to be there to provide, to foster, to sustain, et cetera, those, uh, those notions and those practices. But before we get there, I think there's something absolutely, absolutely crucial um, in what you mentioned. And again, I think very helpful for us to be thinking uh, in the, uh, the, the move that it happens from, from what you were explaining, I believe, the move that happens from practice, and I'm going to use the term, although you would disagree, but I would stick to it for now, practice uh, the move from there to expositionality or publication, as you also very often uh, say. And obviously publication necessarily has a term public in it. And so this idea of rendering something public, um, which I think for a lot of the artists, curators, et cetera, in the room, it's quite interesting because we might say, and some of the examples you presented of the catalogs and the function of the catalogs of exhibitions or for exhibitions or with exhibitions, uh, the role they play as well, not necessarily documenting, but doing something else. And I think it's about this something else that I would be interested in hearing a bit more from you, uh, because 
as you mentioned very well, there's a lot of imperatives in terms of the transparency, originality, and so there's a lot of um, elements that are there kind of expected from us when we say we are doing research. And so what's happening in the notion of expositionality that allows us not to talk about documentation or not to repeat the work in a different way, the work that eventually happened before, but something new that is being put forward as well. And you mentioned articulations very a lot, a lot of times, and I understand that, but if you could tell us as well, in practical terms at JAR, how do you come, especially the process of peer reviewing, I think, how do you come and the other uh, reviewers uh, uh, involved, how do they come to this material uh, in order to precisely uh, make sure that the assessment is not based on, again, originality, or even the act, uh, or, or even transparency, this idea of communication that it needs to speak about the work, but actually do, is doing something else. M many questions. Um, uh, maybe just starting at, at the end there. Um, so, in some sense, um, uh, uh, peer review and editorial work in in that context is really often. You know, conceived as assessments of sorts. I mean, we are assessing. You know, we are gatekeepers for uh, for what we are publishing, uh, and so on. In reality, um, uh, this happens, but it isn't the most interesting part. And in fact, it's not even the most um, invested part on, on our sides. Um, the um, uh, first of all. I would I would argue that that um, like maybe you as readers, whatever issue comes out, uh, with every submission we get, we have no idea what we're going to receive. I mean, it can be anything. It can be from an art discipline. It, need, it can be for whatever. I mean, everybody's always curious to look at when it comes in to see. Oh, ah, I didn't think of that first. And secondly, I was I'm very really surprised about uh, my own in a way uh, presuppositions both in terms of research and taste, artistic or aesthetic taste, where um, I find often um, I not even read, would not start reading properly. Had I not the task of reading properly, <laughs> I would just glance or, or, or do away with it. Um, and, uh, but the moment you, you start engaging in this deep reading process, what happens is that actually, um, I start evaluating things differently. So one of the challenges Art uh, Char has had said from the onset was, you know, the bad art we publish kind of thing, <laughs> uh, because it doesn't really sit well in uh, in, in the kind of uh, you know names that, that uh, and, and practices and, and, and works that, that you usually see. At the same time, you know, we have really a sense of you know gratitude, I think, towards what's happening as you engage with the expositions by, by our authors and artists and, and how effective they are in um, uh, you know, um, putting to one side my own preconceptions, I would bring to that. Um, and the, in, in one way you could say the measure, so to speak, for, uh, for an acceptance or not, has a lot to do with that it works in that sense. It works in the sense that it actually you know, repositions what I what I and the reviewers brought to the table, um, and and this experience of repositioning needn't be articulated in any particular academic way. It can be. I mean, if you think about academic publishing in, in the sciences, it's not dissimilar. You have a knowledge, your peer. You know, something comes in, it changes what you think. You say, "Well, it's good research because actually I rethink physics now because I didn't know that experiment meant that." It's the same process that peers, in a way say, you know, uh, there is something that made me think twice and it's valuable for others to also think twice. Um, but that needn't be negotiated in the same way within, within, the, um, uh, within our sphere. So for instance, context, contextual review isn't as important because uh, the context isn't a set of people, you know, references with which we operate. So there's no point in listing 25,000 artworks within which, you know, this work works, for example. Some people request it, some people do it. Sometimes it's detrimental in the revision phase to the piece itself because it becomes overburdened by the authority of reporting what the context is. Uh, so we, we kind of hedge these kind of things, you know, but, but fundamentally um, 
this is what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is how do I uh, um, stre help strengthening uh, the, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, opening, you know, that this particular piece creates in, in that kind of fabric of expectation that we have. Um, and it's a lot of work still necessary to understand better what that is and how this works. But within art institutes and, and the kind of catalogs, whatever you just mentioned earlier, my argument would be if research moves into, say, um, uh, those, those platforms, I would really want to expect um, to see art in places that I did not anticipate before going there. I mean, mostly I see what I anticipate. I know already what's going to happen there. It's not really that complicated in most cases. There are surprising moments. I'm not, I'm not saying it isn't, but, but this idea that by itself, you know, the institution of art is also research activity uh, or articulate itself as research activity, I think is really a bit of a, of a naive kind of situation. Mostly it's, you know, uh, um, objects, even conceptual objects that are ready made and, and, and move together. And we, we're not really seeing those places open for negotiation, I don't think. But anyway, this is kind of uh, my, my vantage point to this, that, that there is this risk of, um, of um, in a way, taking the, the kind of hierarchies inscribed in contemporary art, you know, into the research paradigm. And we would suffer from this because my experience from Char is just the opposite. It's actually everything that's excluded from art institution seems to become interesting. But anyway, this is like, you know, it's tricky, tricky one. It's, it's not categorical. It's just the reality is, you know, that, that uh, there's a lot of gatekeeping happening. Thank you. Michael, Thank you. On that note, you brought us back to one of the opening questions and how does practice as a form of research disrupt or question epistemological utilitarianism or indeed institutional instrumentalization of the practice of art. Michael, I wish we had more time. Unfortunately, we don't. Uh, you've raised a number of questions, which frankly, I would like to address with you at a later date, specifically around scientific materialism, uh, digital materialities, and how they play into our understanding presently of the knowledge coming out of art as a practice. But for now, the attendees, our panelists too, can approach Michael's work, access Michael's work through the chat bar. There is a direct link to the Journal of Artistic Research. There is also a link to Michael's research on the research catalog. Uh, we do have a final question, which I will have to take forward to this afternoon. Thank you for your question, Juan, but we do have to end this panel now because if you look in your chat bar, ladies and gentlemen, you will find a link either to Gavin Wade's workshop, which will start in two minutes, or indeed Mel Jordan's workshop. But Michael, I would like to take this opportunity finally to thank you, very thought provoking, a lot of issues, a lot of ideas, and I'm sure we will be coming back to some of these as we proceed, not only today, but going forward. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much.